Today's lecture is going to be on population ecology. And fundamentally what this means is we're going to look at what are the factors that determine where a bird lives, both kind of locally habitat-wise and also its, its total distribution. And also what are the factors that are responsible for maintaining uh, a certain number of birds uh, in those areas. So let's look at some examples. Um, one of the species that's been studied in great deal uh, of detail for a long time period are great tits uh, in Europe. And uh, here you can see in one study um, looking at two different locations show a similar pattern of, of quite a bit of fluctuation. So on the uh, x-axis we have year and the y-axis we have number of pairs uh, per hectare. And we see that the, the uh, there is a considerable variation, some high density years and then oftentimes the next year is a, a considerable drop in the population size and we'll talk about what are some of the factors that could be responsible for that. Um, so that's one pattern to notice here but the other pattern is if you look kind of overall there is a general trend for increasing number of pairs per hectare and um, this has been interpreted for this species uh, as being associated with climate change. Um, warmer winters cause less uh, overwinter mortality uh, and a, a preservation of a larger adult population uh, in this species. However, unlike the great tits just shown there in that one location, a lot of species are showing population declines. And we'll, we'll focus more on this in the next uh, lecture. But the key factor for the decline in populations of most species is associated with habitat complete loss or at least uh, degradation of the quality of the habitat so it doesn't support as many individuals. Um, again, some of these species that are showing these long-term declines, again, will show considerable seasonal variation. Um, and you can see that's true for... Uh, scaled quail and, and northern bobwhites, but the, the magnitude of the change for scaled quail, which is a desert dwelling species, uh, more West Texas uh, species, um, much con more considerable variation. Um, and this is because of can variation, greater variation in rainfall uh, ranging uh, among years. Um, but again, what you see in general for both of these species, unfortunately, is a uh, decline in population numbers uh, over time. So when populations do get low, what is the potential for that population to grow back to a uh, more stable number? Because for a variety of genetic reasons um, and density even independent reasons, small populations um, are more likely to go extinct and, and, and don't do well. And so maintaining a, a healthy population is going to be important for maintaining stability of that species. And some species, when their populations drop, have a long uh, road to hoe, um, road to hoe because they, they've got a long way before they can build back up to uh, large numbers. So short-tailed albatross is a great example of this. In the late 30s and early 40s, a uh, series of eruptions on volcanic islands killed off all of the adults uh, breeding in, in colonies and there were a few juvenile individuals that weren't sexually mature and so they were actually out um, pelagic flying around the ocean um, uh, foraging so they survived uh, but th there wasn't uh, breeding actually in this species detected until 1954 where when six pairs uh, reproduced and, and ended up producing three young. Today, uh, after all those years, we're still only around 2,000 uh, birds in this species. Um, but again, this all boils down to the topic we talked about last time, life history patterns. Remember, short-tailed albatross would be one of these that matures late in life. Then when they do reproduce, they may lay one egg every other year. Um, so it's going to take a long time for those populations to be able to build up. Now let's contrast that with a, a different species that has a very different life history tactic, and that's the common starling, or the European starling. Um, the 
New York Shakespearean Society uh, individuals d got the bright idea that they would introduce into Central Park all of the birds that were mentioned in Shakespearean plays, and one of these was the starling. And so they uh, introduced a hundred of these individuals in 1890 into Central Park, and they just took off. Uh, now they are throughout uh, the New World, uh, North and South America, um, at least 20, uh, sorry, 200 million birds in the population now. So, yes, it's a longer time frame than the short-tailed albatross, but not that much um, more con considering the difference between uh, 2,000 birds uh, and 200 million. But again, starlings have large clutches. They uh, mature uh, very quickly and, and get to breeding right away. They can have multiple clutches per year. And so that's a species that's born uh, basically ready to build a, uh, a, a large population if resources are available. Here's another example of how quickly populations can evolve uh, or, or can grow in species that have that, that kind of quick life history tactic. This is uh, data from house finches. They were normally uh, found in the western part of the U.S., but they were introduced into the east onto Long Island in 1940. And what you see here is um, kind of a slow growth rate at first, but then every year there's a, a bigger jump in the population numbers. Now we call that exponential growth, when the rate of growth increases every year. Um, so you know, one year they may increase by two, the next year they may increase by 3%, and then 4%, and then 5%. So every year there's a greater um, um, uh, level of uh, reproductive success and survival. The average in this situation over this time period uh, was 21% uh, in population increase per year, which is just crazy. That's a really fast growing population. Now clearly this level of reproduction uh, or population growth isn't possible. This is what we call exponential population growth. Um, there are various factors that will keep a population uh, uh, down so it can it can drop a population um, sometimes these are density independent factors um, and we're just going to talk briefly about them because we're going to be more interested in the density dependent factors density independent factors means these are things that will potentially negatively impact a population size but it's independent of what that size may have started out as so, for example, uh, we just had a really big storm uh, here last night. Uh, some tornadoes went through the area. Uh, where those tornadoes went through, it could have uh, killed some birds and destroyed nests. But that tornado, its strength did not depend on the size of the population of brown-headed nuthatches as it went through uh, the, that, that population, right? Um, it didn't say, oh, that we can get a, we can kill a bunch of brown-headed nuthatches this time, so we're going to really ramp up uh, the, the the winds here. No, that didn't. You know, weather events, floods, hail. You know, if it happens to kill individuals, it just kills those individuals. But the population size uh, doesn't isn't uh, uh, affected by. Uh, well, sorry, the the severity of the impact uh, is not. Uh, associated with the initial population size of the organisms. Another example of density independent factors, we'll, we'll talk about how fire can be used as a tool to manage um, the quality of a habitat, and that, that's a more density dependent factor, but fire itself, if, if it uh, sweeps through the population and destroys, kills individuals or kills nests directly, um, that again is a density independent factor. The, the severity of the fire wasn't linked somehow to the density of the population. All right, well, let's move into talking about density-dependent growth. Um, density-dependent growth leads away from exponential growth into a, a growth pattern that we call logistic growth, this S-shaped curve. So if you look over here uh, in the figure, we have this initial really rapid growth. That's exponential. But then as it gets to this line right here, this is the line that represents what's called carrying capacity. Um, basically, it's a measure of how many individuals of that species can uh, be supported 
um, by the resources available in, in, in an area. And so the population will slow down as it reaches carrying capacity. All right. So what are some of the things that can uh, regulate carrying capacity uh, and keep a population uh, in a specific habitat at this, this level? So N is the number of individuals in, in a specific population. Dense impact factors can include disease. So again, as you get denser and denser, you're going to have a more efficient spread of disease, which could make individuals uh, die directly or be less healthy, so it reduces uh, birth rates. Right, so fewer eggs being laid, fewer young successfully raised, and um, the whole reason I'm recording these lectures right now uh, is because of of the effect that density plays in disease. Right, so denser populations are going to have more disease, um, and that's going to decrease population size. Um, predation. We'll talk a little bit about how predation, maybe in specific circumstances, may help to regulate populations um, um, if they get too high. But, but predation is actually a relatively weak density dependent factor in many cases. Um, but just basic resources like food supplies, nest site availability, these are going to be the most important density dependent factors that regulate that, that, that regulate a population size at K. It really what is determ it's, that's what determines what K is, what the carrying capacity of a habitat is. Okay, so some, here's some examples. Um, this is looking at acorn woodpeckers, and you see that the, um, uh, as acorn crop size increases, uh, you get more young produced. So the more food available, the, the greater the production of fledglings and populations in that situation would increase. And sure enough, if you look also at just the diversity of of oak species that could be producing these acorns and producing more acorns or a more reliable supply of acorns under different circumstances, you see that the number of acorn woodpeckers in the population uh, also increases. Another example looking at crossbills now, um, the top left shows you the yearly variation in spruce crops. And the, the cones that they produce that the crossbills feed on and as you can see if it's a good year for spruce it's a good year for crossbills um, bad years for their food crossbill populations also suffer because you're going to get increased death rates and decreased uh, clutch production rates and so that this the figure on the right is showing you basically the same thing um, the, the better the spruce crop and a different rating system the better that is, the more crossbill pairs you're going to have in the population. So these are density dependent factors. Um, the density of the birds that are competing for the food in a situation like this is going to cause lots of death rates, uh, low um, uh, birth rates. In a situation like this situation where you've got lots and lots of food, there's going to be less competition. Um, healthier individuals are going to be reproducing more and survive better. So populations are going to increase. You, some studies have experimentally uh, indicated how resource availability can affect population growth and, and um, reproduction in birds. So this is a study on song sparrows in which in some years or in some plots they provided supplemental food and in those cases you got the birds in those to, to breed earlier relative to those that are not provided supplemental food. Yeah, you got a few individuals that, that would produce earlier um, also if they weren't supplemental food, but these are probably just the highest quality territories that were available. Um, most of the population um, didn't have access to the resources and so they had to delay reproduction because of the, uh, the lack of, of available food. And uh, again, this is clearly going to impact population growth by increasing adult survivorship perhaps, but what's being indicated here on the right is increased reproductive success. So when you get supplemental food, you get bigger clutches uh, compared to those that didn't have the supplemental food. So you're basically artificially in this case um, increasing carrying capacity. You're, you're artificially making carrying capacity larger and sure enough you get a, a corresponding increase in population size.
Oops, wrong way. Sorry. Now, carrying capacity, don't think about carrying capacity as being a characteristic of a species. It's a, it's a characteristic of how a species um, can interact with a very specific habitat. And so there may be different habitats that a species uses, and that may be associated with different carrying capacities. So in this study on great tits, you see that there's A, B, and C curve here. A is associated with oak habitats, B is pine oak habitats, and C is a pine only habitats. And you see that the pine only habitats just don't support very large numbers of individuals. Resources are just not there. Um, the greater the uh, density and diversity of oaks, the better your um, carrying capacity and you have a larger population. All right, well, let's talk about um, the linkage between weather and, and food limitations. And you know, we talked about severe weather being a density independent factor, but weather is going to impact the resources available uh, and make it a density dependent factor in that regard. Um, harsh weather can greatly reduce uh, food availability and drop the carrying capacity of habitat in any given year. So El Nino uh, events um, cause major shifts in um, ocean currents that can change the distribution of fish that uh, seabird populations rely on during the nesting season and then it can cause those populations to crash in El Nino years. Uh, La Nina uh, years um, cause increased rainfall here in East Texas and that's been shown to reduce parental care at nest of red cockade woodpeckers and so it actually uh, La Nina years cause uh, are associated with lower reproductive success of that endangered species the red cockade woodpecker. Um, cold winters uh, can drastically impact small mammal populations cause those to uh, die off um, in large numbers and cause um, owl population, northern owl populations to have to shift their habitat uh, winter use and, and they come farther south. So some years um, snowy owls can be seen as far down as north Texas, very rarely, but, but this is in these years where they have a, a population crash. And famously, um, there have been some studies that have demonstrated that not only can food limitations in a year affect the population level uh, in, in, the, in subsequent years, but it can also show how evolution works to make different morphologies adaptive in different scenarios. So here's a classic example of this of the medium ground finch in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, on one specific island, Daphne Major. And what we see is this was a study by Peter and Rosemary Grant. And in 1976, the average bill size was just under about nine and a half. Uh, the considerable variation, some birds have big bills, some have birds had small bills. Well, in 1977, there was a severe drought and it, it especially hit hard species of plants that produce small seeds and those are the species of, of plants that the medium ground finches with the smallest bills relied on they had to eat those smaller bills they just couldn't physically um, uh, handle the seeds from the species that were large seeds and so they had greater death rates because of this drought and lower reproductive success i mean some of them were able to to, to um, find ways to get by on this, but most of them, again, it's just a relatively lower reproductive success and survival compared to big build individuals that could feed off of those uh, larger seeds, um, had a higher survivorship and some reproduction, such that the subsequent year in 78, notice now the bill size, instead of going 9.4, is over 10 uh, millimeters in length. So not, not a huge difference, but consistent with what you would expect given what you know about how this trait interacts with this this ecological challenge put forth by limited food supply uh, of, a, of a certain uh, of certain categories so in a lot of temperate zone species uh, winter is the crucial period that's when you, you tend to see the most mortality associated with birds 
Um, so the, their survivorship in non-breeding season um, um, is oftentimes linked to how hard the, the winter is and what is the food availability uh, during that time period. Fledglings tend to have the highest mortality um, in that first winter compared to adults, but adults can also be affected uh, negatively if there's a, a really bad year, especially if there's a lot of, there's a high density of individuals, meaning there's more competition for limited uh, food availability. Uh, now, low density years, you can actually see population increases. Um, and this is because there's a less uh, competition for uh, uh, food um, and uh, other resources like shelter uh, in those low density years. So here's a study that, that looked at population patterns um, in high density versus low density years. And so if you look on the left here in a high density year, you start off before the breeding season with this uh, number of breeders uh, per 10 hectares. Okay, so it's kind of a measure of the density in the population. Well, during this year, they had really high reproductive success. So this bar right here is the number of fledglings that they produced. That's pretty good, right? So now we're going to take this bar and compare it to this bar as, a, as if we started right here with this being the population size, what kind of retention of individuals do we have going past winter? And so what we see is by the time we get into December, we've lost some of the adults, quite a few of the adults. That, that line is decreasing. Um, so there's been some death rate of that because of the high density, the high competition for these resources. But look at the drop in the number of fledglings. Boy, that's where you really see the drop. Not very many of fledglings survived in this high density year. Um, and overall, what you see is that the population, which was here, has actually decreased. Okay, so we did get recruitment when we have individuals that are juveniles join the, the potential breeding population for the next year, we call that recruitment. So adult survivorship plus recruitment of, of um, juveniles has led to a population that in this case is actually a declining population because of the, the negative impact of a high dense year. All right, let's look at the same uh, species, but now we, we have a situation where it's a low density year, few individuals that are in the breeding population, um, they have some reproductive success, not nearly as much as in this um, um, high density year, um, because there's, we're going to see, we're talking about, th this is the high density year associated with the, the following winter. Um, in the low density year, what you see is that you have, still you have some decrease in the adult population. You see a, a huge, much greater decrease in the um, uh, recruitment of the the juveniles into the future breeding population but you still it, it's still better proportionally than what we had here and because of the success in the recruitment here you have a growing population see both of these bars are bigger than the original breeders uh, that were uh, produced and again that's just because the death rate of both of these uh, was less in a low density year in that uh, non-breeding season. So I mentioned that predation is a potential density dependent factor, but it, it tends to have a minor impact on adults compared to the density, impendent, the density dependent factors like nest site availability and food availability and competition for those types of things and competition for quality habitat. Um, the reason is predators will tend to pick off the weak, the sick individuals that may have died anyway, and so they're really not adding anything um, um, to population regulation. If the population gets l l low, then the predators may just stop um, trying to uh, depredate that one species or certainly won't focus on it. They'll switch to other prey populations of a different species. And so in that case, they're not having any more uh, effect on the population. Um, one exception to this are ducks and upland game birds. Um, looking at their uh, breeding cycles, predation does play a very large role um, in regulating their populations. And another special case is islands. 
um, a lot of birds that have evolved on islands, isolated islands, um, have secondarily lost flight capabilities or effective anti-predator um, uh, nest building skills uh, or just avoiding predation in general. And so if predators are actually uh, are accidentally introduced onto these islands, you tend to have really high predation rates of, of these birds without any natural defenses. And this really is responsible for most of uh, modern day uh, avian extinctions, uh, predators being introduced to islands. And so in these cases, yeah, predators have such a negative impact on the population that they actually cause them to go extinct. Uh, parasites can play a major role in population growth uh, and also the evolution of those species. We've talked about how um, um, females will pay attention to bright plumage and displays and mate choice to, to help pick individuals with good genes and are, that are parasite free uh, as, in, in, in regard to sexual selection. We also talked about how colonial nesting birds tend to have higher potentiality, uh, potential for spread of disease. Um, and so again, this is, explains why it is a density dependent uh, factor. Um, and again, when these things are introduced to islands, they can have even more drastic uh, impacts. So um, where, where the birds are not normally uh, faced with these challenges and don't have any natural uh, adaptive abilities to fight off these um, uh, diseases or parasites. So blowflies have been introduced in the Galapagos Islands and have had a and very negative effects on and many bird species. Uh, bird pox and plasmodium. Plasmodium gives malaria. Um, have both been introduced into the Hawaiian Islands uh, via uh, mosquito introduction by early explorers. Um, and this has caused just havoc in the, the avian community. If you go to the lowland parts of Hawaii, there are no native passerine species. The only passerine species that are native uh, are st stuck up on higher elevations in mountains where they can uh, get away from the mosquitoes because it's just too cool up there. Uh, but with global warming, that is becoming less and less of, of a refuge because the mosquitoes are moving up into elevation uh, into the island. Um, I mean, there are passerines in Hawaii. If you go to Hawaii, you can see northern cardinals, you can see uh, red vented bulbuls, you can see all, you know, Japanese white eyes, um, all kinds of birds from all around the world that have been introduced to take the place of uh, the, the birds that were on the island that didn't have any natural resistance uh, to mosquitoes uh, and the diseases they carry, like plasmodium uh, and bird pox, and they've gone extinct. Locally, uh, a few years ago, we had a big spread of West Nile virus, a novel nirus uh, from Africa that uh, killed off lots of birds in North America. It seemed to hit certain species more than others, so corvids, raptors, uh, chickadees got hit really hard. This is data from uh, American crows showing that um, uh, it initially there was uh, if you start off with a cohort of birds, you see that their, their um, survival greatly decreased, particularly as the mosquito infection rate increased until there was actually very low survival rates uh, of crows for a number of years. But there's an interesting story here. This again, I mentioned it was a novel virus. The few survivors that had natural resistance to this, they're what build up the, the crow population. Um, so they're more resistant to the West Nile virus. And the wet, from a virus's point of view, if you kill your host uh, or you kill your host too quickly before it can spread copies of you, you're not doing yourself any good. And so we tend to see new viruses that show high virulence like this actually evolve to be less virulent, to be less problematic so that they're more effective at using their host to spread more of their viruses. And so... The, the host gain, their, the host population um, becomes more resistant to the viral infections and the viruses themselves uh, evolve to be less virulent as a, uh, as a reproductive strategy of their own to keep, the alive, keep their host alive for more effective uh, fitness from their, their point of view. Uh, hopefully, 
uh, things like this uh, COVID virus uh, is going to do uh, the same thing. Uh, it's just so new that um, it we haven't we don't have any coevolutionary history with it. And once we do get that coevolutionary history, um, um, the 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 overall effect on the population hopefully will be less. All right, let's talk about some case studies now. Um, just trying to put all this together to show you what are some of the density dependent factors and how they can predictably show what is going to be happening to a population. So I mentioned that great tits have been studied quite a bit. Here's some data on that showing that as we get a denser population, the number of pairs, clutch size decreases. If you have a population that's less dense, wow, look at there, you have a big clutch size. So just what you'd expect, uh, expect uh, with density dependent factors. Not only does um, clutch size affected, but the number of young fledged per pair decreases as you get a dense population where there's more competition for resources, uh, greater density dependent pressures, less dense populations not only lay larger clutches, but they also fledge more young because there's more food available uh, young fledge at higher weights uh, and are more likely to survive. And in low density years they even produce more uh, broods per year. So they'll actually nest multiple, more, more likely to nest multiple times compared to dense years where they're unlikely to have success in their first nest and they're certainly not going to nest uh, two times uh, or very rarely. All right, so let's talk about recruitment again and give you another example of that, in this case with the great tits. Um, this bottom here is the number of adults uh, that were nesting in a population. Um, and then now we see this right here is the number in each of these years, the number of locally produced young that they produce. This up here is also typically young birds that are migrating in from other populations trying to find uh, where they can fit into this new population. Um, so in this situation uh, what you see is a considerable amount of recruitment. So recruitment uh, again is young birds joining the breeding population um, and you have a relatively small population of, of adults that are surviving year to year. Well, in this study on great tits, they, they documented this pattern for a number of years in the early 60s. Later 60s, early 70s, they started supplementing these plots with food. The, the consequence of this was the adults had much higher survival rates. Okay, so this bar right here, so that little box right there is much bigger than that little box right there. So with greater adult survivorship, there's less room for recruitment and the recruitment from the local birds was about the same that's kind of comparable to what's going on here but what we see is much less recruitment of individuals from outside of the population okay look at some data from black-throated blue warblers uh, carrying capacity uh, in the habitats where they studied them here was about 10 to 11 adults per hectare and you can see that that's kind of what we see here this line uh, a number of birds but you can see that from year to year the population will overshoot that sometimes then decrease and then come up again so but it, it's it's oscillating around that carrying capacity it, again if they overshoot it one year but maybe that was a year with higher resources uh, that density is going to then lead to uh, a decline in the population in future reproductive success is going to be less likely because because of density and the competition for limiting food in a dense population is also going to increase death rates and so that population is going to grow but again once you get a low population uh, density um, there's going to be less competition for food there's going to be greater survivorship and greater clutch size and reproduction so it's going to come back up to carrying capacity um, so that, that rate of increase, the reproductive success, again, is related to the density. R is relatively high in low dense years. R is relatively low um, in years in which uh, the, the population is dense and there's lots of competition for limited resources. And this is just showing you that same pattern 
um, number of young produced uh, d relative to density, uh, high dense years, you have few young produced, low dense years, lots of young produced, and just showing you by year, showing you that, that year to year you may have a few good years, and then that leads to a few bad years. And then if those bad years end up um, um, leading to lower population density that allows the population then to grow. And so it vacillates back and forth like you see up here. They did a, an experimental study to reduce the density uh, in black throated blue warblers by removing individuals uh, from their breeding habitat and the response was that males spent less time fighting, spent more time foraging so that they were in better shape themselves and had higher survivorship, but they also um, were better parents uh, bringing more food to their young so they produced heavier fledglings. Their territory size increased so there was more food, um, so it was just a win-win situation by lowering the density you uh, effectively made it easier for these birds to have higher reproductive success and higher survivorship and sure enough, you see that the young fledged per territory in the reduced density is much higher than uh, that in the control, where birds were maybe captured and handled, but then released back to maintain the same density. So again, this is showing you if you artificially uh, um, manipulate the population, the density dependent factors operate exactly as you would expect. All right, now let's move from talking about um, population ecology to talking about avian communities. Avian communities are basically just the birds, the, the various bird species that are present in a specific location. And there are certain community patterns that uh, have been uh, uh, described. So basically the larger the area, the greater the diversity in the community, the more species you're going to have in that, in that community. And that's because larger areas have the potential, in many cases, to have more different types of habitats, which uh, is better for more specialized habitats, uh, to provide different uh, ecological niches for more species uh, to uh, cohabitate. Um, larger areas are larger targets for colonization by immigrant species, so species can find these habitats and join those communities at a higher rate over evolutionary time. Um, and larger habitats can support more territories and a larger population, and larger populations um, are less prone to uh, extinction due to density independent like factors, like, you know, uh, sorry, like, uh, you know, severe weather come through and, and wipe out a, a, a large population. Well, that's not as big of a deal if it's a very, very large population to start with in a large habitat that's more widespread. Um, and species that need a lot of room, so very wide-ranging species that need very large territories, um, you're only going to be able to find those in communities that, that start off with having the, the minimum area required by that species. So large areas, again, just for many reasons, uh, tend to be associated with uh, larger, uh, greater diversity uh, in avian communities, more species. There's also latitudinal gradients. Um, equatorial tropical species, tropical communities tend to have more species. And as you go uh, north and south to the poles, you see a decline in the number of species represented in the avian communities. The uh, tropical areas tend to have uh, patterns of higher speciation, so they produce more species locally, and there is uh, uh, less extinction of species in tropical uh, communities and just there's more basic support for a greater number of species with greater ecological diversity um, and um, providing more uh, microhabitats and niches for more species to, to utilize. Two of the famous um, biologists that documented some of the important patterns in um, avian diversity were MacArthur and Wilson and they established what's called island biogeography theory. And the idea is they, they talk about it in perspective of an island and islands being uh, different distances from a mainland or different sizes of islands. But you can think about this as being any habitat patch. 
um, and patches that can be separated from larger patches and, and greater or lesser degree of isolation. So the, their basic idea was that islands tend to be less diverse than mainland areas. And, and a lot of that it has to do with just because of size. So the smaller the island, the fewer the species you can fit on there. You're going to have less diversity in habitats, fewer niches, smaller populations. Um, so bigger islands can maintain um, um, something closer to the mainland uh, type of uh, community level uh, complexity, more species. Um, closer islands to mainlands can basically be more like the mainland itself and they can exchange uh, individuals uh, from the various uh, locations so they're going to be more diverse. But more distant islands are going to be far less diverse. There is going to be greater extinction rates and once something does go extinct on those very isolated islands it's, it's going to be a while before another species uh, happens to fly out there and to establish a new uh, colony uh, in that habitat. So. Um, the more distant you are, the greater extinction rates and the less recolonization and rebuilding of, of a diverse community is going to be. We talked about uh, the importance of uh, primary cavity nesters as keystone species. A keystone species is one in a community whose presence is really key to maintaining a certain level of diversity in that community, such that if you took that keystone species out, many of the species that rely on it would also disappear and you'd have a much simpler, much reduced um, a size avian community. And this was a study uh, showing you how various species of primary cavity nesters uh, use different trees, but then also provide cavities that are used, that are required, by secondary cavity nesters. And the thickness of these lines indicate the prevalence and the importance of these. And clearly in this population, the northern flicker with the, the largest lines um, has all of these connections to so many species of secondary cavity nesters such that if you took out northern flickers, um, you would have a very negative uh, impact on many of these secondary cavity nesters and could greatly reduce uh, the, the avian community. So how do we um, keep track of population levels? Well there are a couple of what we call census methods or survey methods because that, that actually is more accurate because a, a true census is a complete count of everybody in a population. Um, and that's just not really effective in most situations so we do these surveys instead. But oftentimes they're, they're referred to as census methods as well. All right, well, there are two basic things that you want to do. You're trying to quantify um, the number of individuals in each species in a community and the number of species that are representing a community. You can do this by doing point counts in which, um, and I've got a lot of experience doing this, and there are various ways that you can do it. Um, but the basic idea is you go to a central point that's previously established, maybe a random uh, a dot that was picked in, in uh, a, a series of habitats. And you may want to do 20 of these a day. 20 would be a lot, but maybe 10 of these a day. You go to the center of that plot and then you start, you start uh, counting. And you may count for five minutes, you may count for 10 minutes. And every bird that you see in here you record what that is and you may estimate the distance uh, to the, get some detectability uh, framework for uh, the birds because birds that are more difficult to detect and you only see them when they're really close or only hear them when they're really close you can work that into your calculations um, but the idea is to, to, to have at that one spot an estimate on that day the number of, of birds of each species that, that you see and you can compare that to point counts at other locations and you may again do 10 of these in a day. Clearly there's some issues with this. Um, if you start off with uh, one circle at one point count that early in the morning and you don't get to the 10th one or the 15th one until say 11 o'clock in the morning well, the bird activity is going to be greatly reduced at that time period. So in general, 
you're going to be sampling these multiple times and you need to rotate such that all of them get good sample times and bad sample times uh, or uh, so that it that at least is evened out um, you need to pay attention to weather you don't want to make you want to make sure that you're not trying to record on days when it's just raining and birds aren't singing and they're not going to be moving so your detectability is going to be much reduced and not going to be really accurate and comparable to other days so there are a variety of things that you have to consider um, when when doing point counts another thing you can do is walk transects so a transects it would, might be a path through a, a series of habitats and you're just maintaining a very consistent pace and trying to estimate every time you see or hear a bird to your left or your right the distance from the transect line. Um, so it, it's you're doing the same thing as in a point count but instead of being in a single spot and estimating the number of birds that you have you are, are moving through the habitat. Now, one advantage of this over ha over point counts potentially is you're gonna you're gonna be less likely to double count birds, right? So if you're moving through the habitat, you see a cardinal at point A, you keep going, you see a part cardinal ahead of you, and you go, oh no, you know the, that that can't be the same one as I just saw back there because I didn't see it fly it forward. I mean, there's the chance of it, but it, it's less of a chance. You're doing a point count, you hear a cardinal singing to you know the northwest. You turn around a few times and then you hear another cardinal and you go, oh, is that the same cardinal? Or is that a different cardinal? Um, so it, you have to kind of keep track of those things. And that's why it's important to, to do a minimum time frame. You don't want to do a point count that's an hour. Okay, in an hour, you're going to be hearing the same birds over and over and over again. So you can't count each of those independently. Transects can help uh, you uh, avoid some of those issues but you're you're probably going to miss more of the birds uh, by doing it this way you have a tendency to maybe flush the birds uh, artificially uh, some more than others um, and depending on the terrain it may be just really impossible to kind of get through this area if there's like big rubus uh, blackberry vines for example um, crossing your path transects can be very difficult So we've, we've been talking about kind of at the local scale what determines where birds are and how many of them there are. Um, if you look in a field guide, you, you'll see a distribution map. And these field guide maps are simplifications of where birds can be found at different times of the year, say uh, um, year-round versus the breeding ground uh, in this uh, black-throated sparrow, which is a, a, a desert southwest species. And this distribution is a very rough estimate of where there's appropriate habitat where you can see these birds. Um, sometimes you can use heat maps, like shown down here on the bottom left, which shows more detail about the density of the birds that you might expect in each of these areas. Um, so the, the, the lighter this color here, the greater the density uh, of the birds in these areas. Now, as you get to the ranges, the, the boundaries of these ranges, that's where the habitats will become smaller in size, probably less good in quality as they're transitioning into a different habitat. And so the, the, the birds are often rarer and at much less densities at the edges of their range because of that, that habitat tie. Um, some birds are very widespread, some birds are very uh, uh, habitat specific and only uh, have a very limited range and so the, our red cockaded woodpecker is a good example of that. They have to have uh, open uh, mature stands of pine that have been burned very re regularly so it reduces the mid-story um, and, and brushy understory. They need grassy understories um, as opposed to something like peregrine falcon which have a worldwide distributions, uh, great uh, flight capabilities uh, for dispersal, um, much less habitat specific. Uh, 
Um, another thing that will determine bird distributions, again, if they just stay in one place their entire life, they're sedentary, well, they're going to oftentimes uh, occupy less territory as opposed to migratory species that, remember, have to have breeding ranges, non-breeding uh, wintering ranges, and then these transitional um, uh, stopover areas that they need for refueling during the migration uh, pattern itself. So they're going to have more complex distribution patterns. We do know that uh, as climate changes, as um, weather patterns change in general, we're going to see uh, distributional changes through time. And this has already been demonstrated in, in some classic studies in California that have indicated how bird distributions in that state have uh, changed relative to changes in rainfall and temperature patterns. So moving uh, northern, uh, more northerly, or moving up elevations. Uh, is a typical pattern that's been demonstrated and understanding how climate change is likely to um, change temperature and um, food resources uh, and, and habitat um, habitats moving themselves there have been models produced by the National Audubon Society and other organizations to estimate um, you know, say in uh, 2080, how our population is going to change, and you see that there's a general pattern of. So here's the distribution of sandhill cranes um, um, currently, and you see that that's likely to shift north. Same thing for bobolinks. Currently, now their breeding range, and look at how that's going to uh, shift way up, um, and. For most of these birds, that that's the pattern that we see. In some cases, it's it's a little even worse than that because you see, uh, this is Vaux Swifts. Look how small those populations are expected to be because of loss of habitat. Um, so not only a shift of habitats, but but the the range of these in some cases may be increasing, like the bobolink may actually increase. But in a lot of these, we're going to see shrinking of habitat and likely shrinking of population sizes. Uh, which is a, a big conservation concern. All right, so we, we talked about kind of um, getting data locally for, for population densities by using point counts or transects uh, and, and really doing some efficient uh, scientific studies uh, of population trends. And in some species like great tits and, and uh, black-throated blue warblers, we've got these long-term studies that have provided us with some really amazing data to, to uh, document patterns of density-dependent um, population growth. There are other sources of data, though, that provide data that's less detailed. It may have some noise associated with it, but it's been pretty valuable in providing us some long-term population trends for a lot of species in North America. One of these is what's called the Christmas, Christmas Bird Count. It's uh, a program that's been run by the Audubon Society for over 100 years. This is a figure that shows you where bird counts occur. It's usually around Christmas time, a two-week period, and local individuals say, okay, this will be our day that we're going to do the count this year. And then there's a certain uh, radius around a central point that all of the individuals, they, they divide up the, that, that pie, basically, and habitat-wise, and they say, okay, I'm going to go look here, I'm going to go look here, I'm going to go look here, and then we'll come back tonight and we'll tally up all the birds that everybody's seen and divide it by, you know, how many people we had, you know, uh, how many miles we walked, how many miles we drove, things like that. So that you get a rough count of the number of species and the number of birds in each species that everybody saw year after year after year. And you can, you can really get some pretty astounding data. Um, and this is, this is just showing you that how big this program is over uh, 2,000 sites uh, and the number of individuals that participate in this year to year uh, increases. So it's a, a good citizen science project that's been going on again, you know, since uh, 1900. And these are the kind of data that you can get from it. Uh, we can get some pretty good interesting data to show that uh, unfortunately this is true of most grassland species they're showing pretty steep declines, like this eastern meadowlark. Um, 
and this is just showing you that if you look at these trends across all grassland birds again most of their populations are going down like shown here with eastern meadowlark few are actually going up some are, are showing stable but this is the the part that's uh quite frightening is is how quickly uh, how most of them are going down here's another species uh that actually is showing the reverse trend a merlin uh similar to kind of a, a close relative to our american kestrel um, their populations are actually uh, going up. Um, so the Christmas bird count gives us an estimate of populations uh, and communities of birds in the wintertime. There is a breeding bird survey uh, run by um, the USGS that does a similar thing. It, it does, it's a driving thing where you drive a transect uh, down some country roads um, and you stop occasionally and you listen and look for all the birds that you see along that roadside. Um, standardized method, so it allows comparison of different geographic regions. Um, and again, it's a, it's a coarse representation about what breeding birds are in, in different parts of the country. And you can see that, that these uh, areas have been spread out, sampling areas have, have been spread out throughout the country. And so it's giving us, again, some pretty good indication of where some of these uh, birds uh, trends can be seen and um, so for example blue wing warblers it's showing you uh, where they're increasing or decreasing um, and then lastly um, you're actually participating in some of this now eBird um, is collecting data and that's why I wanted you to use this app um, when you submit your records um, you are adding to a database that shows the the community dynamics associated with the areas that you are um, surveying uh, every day. So it, those data are used to make maps like this one here for wood ducks, showing you the density of wood ducks. Um, and you, Cornell Lab of Ornithology is keeping track of this data so that you can not only tell um, kind of a snapshot what birds are in an area but the, how that could change through time through a year uh, what the seasonality of the distribution of birds are but then among years uh, how these populations are, are increasing or decreasing so it can be again coarse but valuable data in the collective but I do want to impress upon you the importance of being pretty sure. Don't be guessing uh, about what birds you're seeing. Um, don't be making stuff up, right? I mean, because these are data that are going to be used by people. Now, I mean, the data are looked at by experts, and if you say, oh, I saw, you know, a prothonotary warbler in East Texas um, in January, they're probably going to dismiss that. Yeah, so, the, I mean, that's, that's highly, highly unlikely. Um, that was clearly a mis-ID and so there is some culling of the data in, in that regard um, but the less they have to do that the better so all right we'll talk about the last topic conservation biology um, next time